All right, welcome uh, everyone who's uh, who's here today. Good to see you all, and a warm welcome to anyone watching online as well. So, this presentation really is about confidence, and it's about how we can have confidence in the things of God. And uh, so, it's about how we can have how we can have confidence in the in the reality of God in the fact that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, and we can have faith and confidence in the in the Bible record. So we all have things that we believe in, even if we we don't believe in God uh, right now. We all have things that we put our trust into, and sometimes we can always all have doubts in those things that we put our trust into. Um, those can be doubts that we avoid because they're uncomfortable and we don't want to confront them um, but if we don't address them head on we can go through our lives um, with a, a weak trust in the in the things that we uh, stand on and the things that we we think we believe and when those beliefs are put to the test we can find out that maybe they're not as strong as we as we once thought so i was an atheist, I, I didn't believe in God. Uh, as far as I was concerned, there was there was no evidence that God was real, and I was a confident atheist. Um, but I hadn't really properly confronted what I believed, and when I did, I found out that I was on shaky ground. And the things that I just wanted to look at today are things which I wish I had considered before I believed, um, because maybe. I would have believed sooner if I'd, if I'd have thought about these things. Um, but these are also things which can give us who believe further confidence uh, in what is true. And there's one question uh, on this earth, on this planet, that is the most important question in, in human history, um, which is, is Jesus of Nazareth, a bit of a mouthful there, the son of God? And you either believe this is true or you don't. There's no there's no middle ground. You can't just uh, avoid the question. And if you try, and if you say, well, you know, each to their own, isn't it? Well, who can really know? Uh, we all have our own ideas of what's right or what's important. Then just by taking that position, you're taking a leap of faith because you're, if you try and have an opinion uh, on God or on Christ, then you're betting your life on something which you can't prove. You're betting your life uh, and maybe your soul on the fact that you believe that there's no God who will hold you accountable for your beliefs and your behavior. So it's so important to consider this question for, for everyone on this earth and to understand and know what the answer to that question is. And once you can answer that question, you will know with clarity who you are. You will know why you are, why you are here, and you will know what to do about it. So to know whether Jesus of Nazareth, it's the Son of God. I'm just going to say Jesus Christ, but we know we know who I'm talking about. Uh, first of all, we need to ask ourselves a question: How can we know if God is real? And if we're unsure about this, or if we need more uh, confidence in this question, there are two things which we can look at, which can give us clues to that. Two directions we can look: we can we can look outwardly at the physical world, this material world that we live in. And we can also look inwardly at ourselves, at our hearts and minds. And we're going to look at both of those things um, and where the evidence of God is in, in both those directions. And there are many clues, uh, many pointers to the existence of God, which people can dismiss as, well, it's just a coincidence, you know, just a coincidence. It could just be luck. But at some point, coincidences become so unlikely that, they defy any rational explanation and instead they start to point to a deeper meaning you know an example of that if we if we both said okay we're both going to write down a random number between one and a million and see if we can get the same number and if we managed it once okay you could call that a coincidence if we managed it 10 times in a row if we managed it 100 times in a row you would have to be pretty naive to start thinking, okay, that's still a coincidence. You know, if you if you've got any sense about you, you'd think, well, something's going on here. There's a there's a bigger plan behind this. This isn't just luck. And that holds true when we broaden that out and we and we look at this universe, we look at this universe that we live in. 
And uh, the universe that we live in is a finely tuned universe. And we don't need to understand, you know, what all of these different uh, these different things up here mean. Um, but there are different laws of physics. There are different physical laws. There are different physical constants uh, in this universe. And they are so precisely set. And the more science has discovered about this, the more they've found out how precisely these, these values need to be set. That if they were slightly different, uh, life as we know it could not exist. So gravitational force, I think we, we all understand broadly what, what, what gravity is. Um, if it was too weak, then the planets and the stars would never have been able to form together. If it was too strong, the, the stars would have just burned up quickly and there would, and there would be no planets. Um, electro, electromagnetic force, that's a force that is within bonds, within chemicals. If it was much stronger or much weaker, we wouldn't have stable chemicals. We wouldn't have things like oxygen, carbon, which are essential for, for all life. Um, the strong nuclear force, that is the force that holds together the nucleus, the, the centers of atoms. Um, if it were weaker, the, the, these atoms, they just they wouldn't be able to uh, hold together in a stable fashion um, and, and things that are essential to life would, uh, would go away. And just to give a, a sort of picture of how uh, sensitive we're, uh, we're talking here, uh, the strong nuclear force is uh, so much stronger than gravity, uh, 10 to the power of 40 times stronger. So that's a one with 40 zeros, 10,000 billion, 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 billion times the strength of gravity. And if we think of um, the, the, the dial of how sensitively that needed to be set as a, a ruler spanning across the entire length of the, of the universe, which is about 15 billion light years, if it was adjusted by even one part in uh, a one with, with 34 zeros on the end, which is the equivalent of moving it, that little dial that's the size of the universe by one inch, a, star, a dial the size of the universe, if it was moved by one inch to the side, this universe could not have life. And this is, uh, this is something that the more man has discovered, the, the more uneasy it has become with this reality, that we have a universe that has been precisely made exactly how it needs to be for, for life to exist. And you could call it coincidence. Um, one example here was if a universe could make itself, could a cake ever bake itself? What do we think? Anyone think a cake could bake itself? No? Well, if, if we set up an experiment, if we were very, very generous with this experiment, if we put all the ingredients there, you know, uh, if it was a, a simple vanilla cake, uh, I'm sure even I could bake one of those. Uh, but if we if we put all the ingredients out there in, in random amounts, we put a mixing bowl there, which moves in a random way, we put a, a baking tray with there, which is, you know, nearby in the same room, and it moves in a random way. So it's possible that, you know, all the ingredients could mix themselves together and accidentally fall into this baking tray. And there's an oven nearby that randomly turns itself on and off at random times, at random temperatures. It's technically possible that a cake could, could bake itself. Um, but the chances of that happening are uh, one in 10 septillion, which is this one with, uh, one with 25 zeros, which is also the number of grains of sand there is on the earth or the number of stars there is in the, in the universe. That's the chances of a cake baking itself, which if, we, if we're generous, is technically possible. It's te technically possible. It's never happened and it's incredibly unlikely it ever, ever will but it's technically possible. So if we look at the universe, what's, what are the chances of a universe creating itself with all of these finely tuned elements exactly how they, how they need to be? Um, so the, the chances of that are actually that, that number, which uh, I, I'm not going to say how many billion, billion, billions there are because I'll be here all day, but that, that's a one with 229 zeros, which is, uh, well, the entire number of atoms in the whole universe is a one with 80 zeros, so less than half of that. Um, so th this is the chance that the universe could, could have created itself by chance. And this, 
This is calculated by someone who doesn't believe in God. This is calculated by a leading uh, physicist in the, in this area of, uh, of physics, um, and, it, and it's been been agreed upon. So uh, even Stephen Hawking, you know, a pretty well known uh, scientist, he's he's passed away now. He he never believed in God, but he. He admitted, uh, he said, the remarkable fact is that the values of these numbers, the constants of physics, seem to have been finely adjusted to make possible the development of life. So this number, it makes people who don't believe in God and who understand the science behind it, it makes them very, very uneasy and it makes them very, very uncomfortable. Because if, say, you had a billion chances at making a universe, you know, it, it would still be as close to impossible as you can. That that number is impossible. But you might as well say that is impossible. That is a, a thing which will never, never, never happen. So the leading theory, and if you don't believe in God, you've got to come up to an alternative uh, that, that this universe was created with a purpose, which is exactly what all the evidence seems to show. So the leading theory uh of the alternative to uh, a creator is the multiverse and it sounds like something out of you know the latest uh marvel superhero movie but this this is actually the leading scientific theory to explain uh how the universe could have created itself and so this is the idea that there could be not just one universe an almost infinite number of different universes that have different laws of physics. You know, the speed of light is different there. Gravity works differently there. And because there's so many different universes, we just happen to be the lucky ones. We just happen to be in the one where, you know, it all, it all worked out. And uh, there's a few problems with that. <laughs> um, the main one is the fact that zero evidence for it. It's, it's basically the scientific equivalent of a fairy story but it's the only alternative they can come up with to, to, to try and explain how possibly this unlikely universe could have come into, uh, into being. But um, a leading uh, professor of mathematical physics at Cambridge called this multiverse theory a metaphysical guess of excessive ontological prodigality, which in English means it's a guess about the nature of reality that assumes too many things exist. So it's, it's basically just uh, making assumptions that all these other universes exist when there's no evidence for it. So to put it in very plain English, it's made up. <laughs> it, is, it is made up. And if we can't explain any alternative, you know, the simplest answer is, is the correct one. That's actually a sci scientific principle, Occam's razor. And the simplest explanation for why we have a universe that is so perfectly and precisely designed for, for life uh, is that it was created with a purpose. And there's uh, a question, uh, I suppose, an objection that often people come up with when they're faced with the reality or the possibility that there could be a God, which is, well, if there's a God, why is there suffering in the, in the world? And this is another way, actually, where we can have a look for some evidence of the reality of God. So we've looked outwardly at the universe and we can look inwardly now. So what people usually mean when they when they say, why is there suffering as well? If there is a God and if he's an all powerful God and if he's a good God, you know, why do, why do bad things happen? Why is there uh, injustice? Um, and it's, it's strange that we would be surprised by that. Uh, if we don't believe in God, because if we, if we didn't believe in a God, well, you know, we're all just animals and there's no kingdom that's so full of brutality and injustice as the animal kingdom. You know, the strong prey upon the weak, uh, the, 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 if you're disabled, you're, you're basically dead in the, uh, in the animal world. No one's, no one's going to help you out. And, um, you know, whole, whole species and whole, uh, whole life, um, ecosystems of, of uh, animals can just be wiped out, can, can starve and be destroyed. Uh, there, is no, there is no justice, there is no fairness um, in, the, in the animal kingdom. And so if we believe that all we are is, is animals, well, then why would we, we, we be surprised that there was uh, injustice in the world? But the fact that we recognize that 
there is wrong in this world, which there is, you know, bad things happen to good, good people, good things happen to, to, to bad people. Um, there's, there's a lot of unfairness. There's a lot of uh, horrible things which, which aren't right um, that, uh, that do happen. And just the, the very fact that we can recognize that injustice, that's a clue that there's something within us, there's something deep inside us which believes that there is such a thing as right and wrong. You can't prove that there's such a thing as good and evil, scientifically, just and, and unjust, right and wrong. But we all, every single one of us, regardless of what we believe, we all know it that these things are true. They can't be measured, but we know that those are, are true. And exactly what we see in this world today is exactly what the Bible tells us to expect to see. This is a, a fallen world. You know, it's a, it's a world where we've been given the freedom to make our own choices. And those choices have consequences. And a lot of people, they use that freedom to make the wrong choices, to make bad choices. And what we see is, is a world which has fallen from what it should be, a world which is sick, a world which is uh, broken. But the Bible also tells us that there's a cure to this sickness. But we can't access that cure until we accept the diagnosis that we are sick and that this world, it is broken and it needs help. And, you know, people can say, well, it doesn't, very, it doesn't really matter what the cause of, of all this injustice is. You know, if there is a God, then, you know, it's all on his head and he can't get off the hook for that. Um, but what Christianity shows us is that we have a God who isn't trying to get himself off the hook. We have a God who deliberately put himself on the hook. He put himself on the hook of human pain and suffering deliberately. And so we can't know the reason for every, every single thing that we suffer in life, every, every single bad thing that happens in this world. We can't explain the reason individually of all of those, but we know what the reason is not. And it is not that God does not love us because he, he proved that when he put himself, uh, put his son on the, uh, on the hook, on the cross of that pain and suffering. So when we consider... Uh, that there is, there is a God, the evidence points to the fact that there is a God inwardly and outwardly. So the next question is, what about Jesus? What about this man, Jesus of, of Nazareth? It was Jesus Christ. Uh, was he the son of God? Now, what did he say about himself? He said these astounding, extraordinary, shocking, uh, staggering things about himself. I am the resurrection, I am the way, I am the good shepherd. I'm the light of the world. I am the true vine. I am the truth. I am the door. I am the bread of life. These are incredible things to, to claim about yourself. And they are either true or they are false. There's no middle ground. These things he said are either true or they are false. Now, if they're false, then we have to consider that either he knew they were false he said these things knowingly false, or he said these things without knowing they were false. So we'll look at both of those alternatives to see how, how, they, how they hold up against, against the truth. So if he said these things unknowingly false, if he said, I am the son of God, I am the bread of life, I am the door, I am the way. If we heard someone on the street saying those things, you know, you'd think, okay, you, they need a bit of help, you know, someone, someone needs to come and put a bit of an arm around them, like, you know, you're not the light of the world, you know, come, come on, let's get you a cup of tea, <laughs> you're not the true vine, all right, you know, steady on, these are, these are the words of a madman, if they are false, they are, they are the words of someone who is not quite in touch with reality, um, but these are some other words of, of Jesus, so if he was a a lunatic who believed that he was somehow the son of God and divine and, and all of these special things. And he was, he was the way that people would, would go and they had to eat his body and drink his flesh to be part of the kingdom of God. You know, if, if all of this was the ravings of a madman, well, he also said all of these things. And these things are, these things are sayings which are held up even from those who don't believe in, in God or in Christ as some of the most profound words in human history. Turn the other cheek, judge not lest you be judged. Do unto others as you would have them do unto you. Love your enemies, 
the good Samaritan, love your neighbor as yourself. A couple of sort of paraphrase to, uh, to fit it in here. Actions speak louder than words. Uh, it's what's on the inside that counts. Uh, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. One man in just three years, three years of speaking publicly to the world said all of these things. And since that time, there's been thousands of years, there's been thousands of writers, philosophers, speakers, leaders of nations, and all of them put together have not had the deep influence on human thought and history than this one man had in three years. You know, we see uh, at, at the bottom many of the sayings that we even use in, in regular speech today, you know, asking you pearls before swine, calling someone the salt of the earth, the blind leading the blind, the spirit is willing, but the fresh flesh is weak. You know, the, Lord, the Lord's prayer, people know that. Uh, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. These are things that uh, are used constantly, even, even uh, removed from a, uh, a religious context. Um, so to believe that he said these things unknowingly false and also said some of the most wise, profound words in human history, we would have to believe that both he was a man who was a few eggs short of a dozen, to, to put it blindly. And if someone truly believes that they are God in some way when they're not, you're going to see a few other abnormalities and imbalances with them. Now, they're not going to be quite right in the head. You generally wouldn't find them speaking, you know, the words greater than any, any wise man or philosopher or thinker uh, in, in the entirety of human history. But nothing in the behavior of Jesus, you know, suggests that he was off kilter <laughs> you know you can't read the gospels and come away with a picture of a man who is mentally ill so it, it doesn't fit it doesn't work but what about if he was knowingly false if he if he just if he just lied about these things you know that he was the son of god that he was the way that he was the truth um he would be a deceiver he would be a fraud he'd be a, a hypocrite um and the audacious thing is that no one else in the entirety of human history spoke more against hypocrisy than Jesus of Nazareth. No, not a single person has ever said anything as, as strong and as wide and as deep against being a hypocrite as Jesus of Nazareth. We see just some of the examples here. This is all about hypocrisy. Beware the influence of hypocrisy. Nothing is covered up that will not be revealed or hidden that will not be known. Wolves in sheep's clothing, a generation of vipers, whitewashed tombs, beautiful on the outside but full of dead men's bones, teaching their own traditions as if they were God's word, falsely claiming to be Christ. If you lie, you're of the devil who is the father of lies. So we would have to believe, if he said these things knowingly false, that the most vocal anti-hypocrite on earth was also the greatest hypocrite on, on earth, which again, it did, you know, the, 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 what's the saying? The square doesn't circle, the circle doesn't square. It doesn't add up. It doesn't fit. Because we'd, we'd have to believe that this man was evil. He was pure evil. Let's not forget, if, if he was a liar, he deceived these people away from, from the truth. He told them that they, they had to follow him. They had to believe in him. His name was the, was the only way. So he led these people into, into falseness and, and darkness. Uh, he was, he was two-faced. He, he was a hypocrite if he knowingly said all of these things. And he was also, we'd have to believe, a fool because he could have told the truth any time if, if he was deliberately lying and saved himself from horrendous torture and execution. And, you know, when people lie in these sort of ways, it's usually for power, money, influence. You know, it's usually to gain something. Jesus lied his way into being outcast from society, being penniless, being homeless, and being tortured and murdered and abandoned by his friends. Not a great plan. Not a great plan if that, if that was if that was his plan, but at the same time, how if he was such a deceitful and depraved man, how could he maintain consistently throughout his life from beginning to end such a pure and perfect character that those who knew him best and who were closest to him believed in what he was saying so strongly that they would die for him? So someone who lived the way he lived taught the way he taught, said the things that he said, he could not have been a liar, knowingly or unknowingly. 
it, it does not add up. It doesn't make sense. The fact that he was telling the truth about his nature, about his personhood, about who he was, the son of God, it's the only, only explanation which fits. And uh, if he is the son of God, you know, what matters is whether he was resurrected. If he was risen again, if he, if he was raised from the dead, Paul, uh, the apostle Paul in the, in the Bible said it himself. He said, it, he said, if Christ is not risen, then your faith is in vain. The whole of the Christian faith hinges on the fact that Jesus Christ was raised from the dead. And it's only the gospel record on that which makes sense. If you believe that Jesus Christ didn't rise from the dead, then you have to explain how the Christian church could have got going founded on a on a lie and one of the um one of the things we can look at is the detail in the gospel record uh it says in this uh, scripture at the top here and they compelled the passerby simon of cyrene who was coming in from the country the father of alexander and rufus to carry his cross why mention what his kids names were what possible relevance does that have to the story the reason to mention that is that the majority of the, the books of the New Testament, they were written between sort of 15 to 30 years after the, the crucifixion. So these people, Alexander and Rufus, they were around. People could go and seek them out. People could go and find them and say, tell us the, tell us the truth. What happened? What, what did you, what did, even if Simon was you know, still around, Alexander and Rufus were, the only reason to mention detail like the son's names is so that people could seek them out and verify the truth of, the, of this story. If it was a lie, you, you know, you wouldn't want to give the game away. You wouldn't want you wouldn't want to give away detail that people could fact check, essentially. And uh, in First Corinthians, uh, we read he was buried and he rose again the third day, according to the scriptures. After that, he was seen of above 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain unto this present but some are fallen asleep. So we read here that Jesus appeared after his resurrection to more than 500 people, the majority of which, when Paul was writing this, probably 15 to 20 years after, the majority of which were still alive. It would be very, very easy to go and seek those people out and find out, was this true? You know, we've, we've, we've seen this thing written down, we've seen this thing proclaimed in the synagogues, proclaimed in the streets. They, all of these people are saying that Jesus was risen from the dead. Is it, is it true? And uh, at the end of Acts, uh, this is Paul again speaking, um, speaking in front of a uh, king. And he said, the king knoweth of these things before whom also I speak freely, for I'm persuaded that none of these things are hidden from him, but this thing was not done in a corner. It was not done in a corner. It was not, Jesus' resurrection was not a, a secret thing that only two or three people saw. Uh, the, these, this was something that was public, a public event. And the, the fact is that when we read the Gospels, what we are reading is an eyewitness account. And fictionalized eyewitness accounts <laughs> uh, that was not a style of writing which existed in the in the ancient world. You know, you you can read a uh, a modern fiction novel and it might be presented in the in the style that you know it, okay this is something that actually happened that you know the people have seen. But that style of writing only developed in the, in the last three hundred years. Um, you would have to believe that out of nowhere, all of these independent people came up with this new style of, of fiction writing that never been around in the, in the world before or for uh, over a thousand years after um, of fictionalizing these eyewitness accounts. And the gospels, when you read them, they include very specific minor details, which are the exactly the type of things which could have struck someone who was an eyewitness to that event. You know, at times we're told, uh, at one moment we're told that Jesus stooped down on the ground and he, and he wrote in the dirt with his finger. We're not, we're not told what he wrote. We're not told any any other detail than that why are we told that well because someone who was there saw it and they remembered that detail and they they told it to the gospel writer or, or the, the the gospel writer themselves re remembered it we're told uh that 
to, um, after his uh, resurrection that there was a, a miraculous haul of fish. And we're told 153 fish were hauled in in a, in a miraculous catch. We're told that the boat was about 100 yards out from the water when this miraculous catch happened. We're told that uh, earlier in his life, when Jesus was uh, asleep on a boat in the midst of the storm, there's an, an extra detail now, which is completely irrelevant, adds nothing. It says he was asleep in the boat on a pillow. That, that, that detail adds nothing to the, to the account at all. None of these details are relevant to you know, the, the plot of the, the gospel. So why are they there? They're there because they happen. They're there because people witness them. And if this was a made up story, uh, there is no way that they would have made up the detail that the first people to discover the empty tomb and that Jesus had risen were women. Women's testimony was not even admissible in court at that, at that time. If you were making up that story, you wouldn't put that detail in because it would make your story seem less credible to everyone else that you were telling it to. So why would they include that? Because it was true. And the disciples and the followers of Jesus, they stood up very, very publicly almost immediately after these things happened. We're not talking years and years after. They, they stood up, you know, the day of Pentecost happened 50 days after that Jesus was uh, raised up into heaven. And immediately after that, they were out in the streets and they were proclaiming that this thing had happened. You know, the Jews and the Roman authorities, they didn't want that resurrection to have happened. So if it didn't, well, they would have disproved it. They would have just brought out Jesus's, you know, decaying corpse and said, well, look, no, he didn't, he didn't resurrect, you know, this, this is not going to go anywhere. But it didn't, it didn't happen. And um, when it comes to, Ah, there's a yeah specific uh, use of the word eyewitnesses. So this is this is Peter who saw most of these things, and he he attested himself. We have not followed cunningly devised fables when we made known unto you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His Majesty. These were not legends. These were not uh, you know dreams or, or visions. Um, that were happening to hundreds of people at the, uh, at the same time. They were eyewitnesses of these things. And when it comes to the New Testament as a historical document, um, the more copies you have of, of uh, a document um, in history, the more easily you can verify if there have been any changes to, to that document and um, the, the accuracy of it. So the, the three... Uh, ancient documents that were which are there are the most copies of there's this guy called the Dem Demosthenes um, some Greek philosopher I don't I don't know him but there were 400 copies of his works uh, Homer's Iliad a very famous uh, Greek play there was 1800 copies of his work uh, the New Testament just in the original Greek not even counting all the other languages it was translated to 5824 copies and it's remarkable that the details of Christ's resurrection are identical in all of those in all of those copies. This is not a document which has been manufactured or altered after the uh, after the fact. Um, this is one of the the most verifiably true historical documents in history. When you when you count the other languages at the time, not again not modern languages at the time that it was translated into, like um, you know Arabic and uh, Latin, uh, Syriac, Coptic Greek, um, there's there's more than twenty thousand copies of it. So we can see if we if we look at the evidence outwardly in this material world that God is real. If we look at the evidence inwardly in our hearts and, and minds of what we know about right and wrong good and evil that's built into us we can see that god is real that god is true if we look at the evidence of jesus christ and the things that he said there's only there's only one account which adds up which is that the things he said about himself were true which was that his resurrection was true was was an, an actual event and that changes everything that changes everything if christ was raised from the dead then all of a sudden, you know, you can know who you are, you can know why you are, and you can know what to do about it. And you can know that there is more than the material life that we see. There is a greater plan. This, this universe was created with a, a purpose. And uh, there's a, a final piece of um, evidence that is very clear that we can, that we can all experience, which is uh, receiving the Holy Spirit. This was something that happened 
on the day of Pentecost, 50 days after Jesus was uh, was risen to, to heaven. Uh, it says in Acts chapter 2, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And this is something that was evidence to me when I had this experience, which was written about in this old book, you know, over two 2,000 years ago, and I had the exact same experience. And every man, woman in, in, this, uh, in this room has had that exact same experience. And that exact same experience is, is available to you. You can be filled with the Holy Spirit, with the Holy Ghost and fire, and you can see the truth and the evidence of this, uh, just as we can see the evidence of everything else um, to do with, uh, with God. And you can know that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He was raised from the dead. And what does that mean for you? It means glorious things. It means wonderful things. And um, I'll just uh, I'll just leave those things there.